So, John. Yes. Have you ever seen the movie Jurassic Park? Yes, I have. Are you involved in a modern day Jurassic Park? Is that what's going on here? I am involved in something similar to that. <laughs> that was the first thing that I thought when of. We were talking about that. Yeah. That's the first thing that came to my mind. Is Mine Jurassic too. Park. Yeah. Is it really? Yes, it was. So, we're going on a crazy tangent and people are like, what the heck are they talking about? Yeah. So, let's start out with... What do you have in your backyard right now? Well, I have a couple hundred roller pigeons. I, I've uh, had roller pigeons since I was a little guy, about eight or nine years old. There's about 300 different kind of pigeons. Uh, what you're referring to is I made a connection with a scientist not long ago, a few, uh, three or four years ago. He's doing a project on bringing back an extinct pigeon called a passenger pigeon. A lot of people could confuse them with uh, messenger pigeons, but it's an entirely different pigeon. And uh, the last one died out uh, over 100 years ago in 1914. And he's working on bringing those back. And so I'm going to help him. Yeah, that is, mm -hmm. that's wild. So what's, what's the difference then in a passenger pigeon and a carrier pigeon? Because I don't... I mean, you just have to treat me like a small, dumb child That's in this okay. situation. Uh, well, everybody's into different things, so your, your mind goes different ways. You can't know everything. Uh, carrier pigeon carried messages, like in the war. And they used a, p a specific pigeon for that called a racing homer. Passenger pigeon, what looked a lot like a morning dove. Have you ever seen those? Yeah, yeah. You know, got the long tail and the brown. And That's one of the first birds. This is random, mm -hmm. but when I was in school... I had to do a lab, so uh, some type of science class, and one of them was ornithology, was bird watching, and so I was like, oh, I'll take this, you know, I get to go outside, but then I loved it, mm -hmm. and so like uh, morning dove was one of the first calls that I started to recognize. Uh, uh, what was one? There's a couple other bird calls. Can it's, you can you do the morning uh, the morning dove call? <laughs> no. I mean, I can do it. I might be able to. You I, can do I it. I used to. Let's see. That's it right there. I'm not going to try. Okay. My, my version's not going to be that good. My version's going to be like, that's some dead animal, some dying animal yeah. back behind a trash that, can. That, that's how they communicate with each other. But uh, this extinct, extinct bird they're bringing back looks a whole lot like it, but they're a lot larger. And if you ever want to see one in person, you can go down to the Portsmouth Public Library. They have one down there that's mounted. It's in a glass dome. They'll be glad to show it to you. Um, it's the last one seen uh, here in Portsmouth. And, of course, some guy shot it for his mother because she was a taxidermist, and she knew that they were very few of them, and she really wanted one for her collection. So he wow. shot it, and she stuffed it, and then they donated it to the Portsmouth Library. So that's where it's at right so now. So what, what happened with the messenger pigeons? Uh, what, the passenger pigeons? Well, the passenger pigeons. Uh, the, what we done was we started industry on these things. Uh, we're going back to the 13 colonies, when people come in, the Indians not only told us, taught us how to plant corn, but they taught us how to catch passenger pigeons to eat. And they would be, thousands of them would be flying by in a flock, and they'd throw a stick through them and knock down a couple and eat them. And they, they were really good to eat. And uh, over the years, as time progressed, uh, the industry grew. It grew into an industry where we would send out trappers to watch their migration, and we knew where they were going to land, and we would build these big nets and shoot them over them and capture them, and then we would pluck all their feathers. Their feathers were like second to uh, goose feathers. Really? Yeah, so the most elite would go with the goose feathers, and everybody else would buy the uh, passenger pigeon feathers for pillows and mattresses, things like that i got to watch how I move my hands around. I've done I know. You I'm keep beating up my microphone, I'm clobbering man. your mic. What is the yeah. deal? I'll get it together here in a minute. Well, and see, that breaks into a whole other conversation. So you are, and, and you correct me, you correct me where I'm wrong. So in the 90s, when it came to your pigeons, you were a world champion. 1994. 1994. So explain yeah. to me, when you say a world champion, like what's that mean? Like how do you compete to become a world champion with your pigeons? I'll tell you that, but I wanted to back up if I could. Just oh, for a yeah. second. Go yeah. back to the passenger pigeon. We uh, liked the meat, so we would pickle it, smoke it, do everything we could. We shipped them on trains. We, It was a great big industry, and we just depleted them. Mm -hmm. uh, 
we tried to get him to stop, you know, uh, not me personally, but the, the people who could sure. s- see him disappearing. And uh, they said, no, there's so, there were six billion of these things. Wow. There were more birds, more passenger pigeons than there were all other birds combined. And uh, I'm sure they had these guys that go, what do you call them, um, uh, in politics. It's always trying to get you to. Like a lobbyist or something? There you go. That's the word I was searching for. You got these lobbyists saying, oh, they'll be fine, they'll be fine. And, uh, and we, we destroyed them. We, really similar we, like we the American buffalo. Very similar. Yeah. The American buffalo was the reason that they finally decided to stop the passenger pigeon because American buffalo was getting decimated too, and they could see that, you know, there's a big problem going on here. But it was too late. There was a few of them left, but not enough to, to save them. Yeah, yeah. Back to competition. <clears throat> there's over 300 different kind of pigeons and there's a one particular kind that will go up and fly and it'll do somersaults and they'll go anywhere from five foot ten foot in competition we want to stay around 30 feet with these things but some of them will go more than that and they'll crash hit the ground so you want, on breeding, you want to try to breed the short ones to the deep ones to try to keep them stable. Because if you breed short to short, they'll get shorter. If you breed deep to deep, they get deeper. So, you know, you're always working with that average. And no matter what you do, sometimes it don't work out properly with some of your birds. But when I grew up in Portsmouth, my cousin had these things. And uh, before he had those, though, he and I would go catch these wild pigeons. I always had a thing for, for birds. And uh, I used to catch wild birds. And I found out that you could get a pigeon... And if you had it long enough and turn it loose, it'd come back. And I was really excited about being able to watch a bird fly, let it be a bird, and then still come home, and you could do it again wow. the next day, right? So we got into p- uh, pigeons, me and my cousin Rodney, Rodney Cade, uh, going in these old condemned buildings as a kid down around Second Market. And we'd get them, we'd put them in gunny sacks, we'd take them home, we'd put them in our uh, crudely built pigeon pens. And... Uh, feed them, water them, take care of them. We'd turn them loose and they'd fly. It was really cool. One day I was taking a shortcut through uh, a guy's yard on my way home in the city and I thought, wow, he had some really nice bird lofts. He had some really beautiful pigeons in there and I went up and I looked at them. They had little bands on their legs. And I thought, man, you know, I went up and knocked on his door and uh, this guy named Bobby Nagel came out and uh, he's about 19. And I said, uh, I was about, 12, I think, at the time with the rollers. And I said, uh, hey, buddy, I've seen your birds out there. I said, you know, what are they? And could you tell me about them? Sure. And he was real nice. Gave me the tour. Told me they were Birmingham rollers. They origi- originated from England and that they did somersaults. Once he broke it all down for me, I had to have some. And I bought my first two off of him and went home. And eventually I got rid of all my wild pigeons and I got into those. Well, riding bicycles around the city all the time, uh, I ran into uh, other bird guys, and I started getting more and more. And then I had little friends I didn't know I had at the time, but that be, we became friends, uh, other kids. And uh, so me and one particular boy, Steve Gamble, we would go just make it a day, go around and try to find all the bird guys we could. And back then, they were everywhere. And they were always real nice. We'd knock on the door, we'd do the same routine everywhere we went. <laughs> and They'd come out and they'd give us the routine show, and we would always try to get a bird off of them. Most of the time we didn't, but a lot of times we did. And once we got to know them, after time passed, they they would get a little bit uh, easier to get a bird off of them. That all evolved into, uh, we found out later growing up, that they actually would compete with these birds. They'd put them up. Uh, there's two ways of competing. One was an 11-bird fly, another one was a 20-bird fly. And... Depending on how well your birds rolled, they have to roll a certain depth to score. You get so many points for that. And then also there's wing placement. Depends on where their wings are set. They set different optical illusions. Determines what kind of points you get. So as time went on and I got older, I decided to get into those. And uh, I did that for many years, many years. That is wild. Mm -hmm. So it all started just... You and your buddy being bored and catching a couple wild pigeons and then realizing that once you let them go, 
they, they, would, come they back. would come back. Yeah, pigeons would come is back. That's wild. Yeah, if you take care of them, feed and water them, they get used to the food being there, and they get a look, good look around at the environment, and they, they get a good lock on this is home. Uh, you can't run them off. Well, and we we went out to you know where you've got your pigeons, and one thing I was blown away with is, I mean, when you were feeding them, you'd open up the back of their of their uh, loft, mm-hmm. and they just hung out there. I mean, it was no big deal. I mean, they I. Like, I remember you just walking off me saying, well, there goes John, and the pigeons are just hanging out here with me now. You know, that gets everybody that goes back there. And growing up, just about everybody that flew their birds, and a lot still today do, that door that I open, when they decide to release them, they'll take a stick or they'll throw their hat in there and all the birds will fly out. And once your birds are used to going out that door like that, then anytime you open it, they're, they're ready to rock and roll, they're ready to go fly. What happened out here was, I don't fly out of that door, I fly out of the door directly across from them, so they're creatures I haven't, they're used to just going out the other side, so I can open that up the door and they'll, they'll stay in there, it is pretty neat. But, it was amazing. Yeah, but for, like for in your case, you wanna see the birds, I can open the door, get a good look, we can talk, and this and that, to whereas if I flew them out that side, I'd be fighting them to keep them in there, and you could just barely peek in to see them, you know. Well, and I got the chance to hold one of your younger <coughs> birds. I mean, it was just as calm as could be, relaxed. I mean, you know, it was like picking up a cat or something like that. They are good little creatures. They won't hurt you. Even if they did peck you, the only time they would is if they were sitting on eggs, raising babies, something like that. And even then, it, it's nothing bad because their beaks are designed to pick up seed, not to tear meat like hawks, you know. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, and that's, you know, even just being out there and us looking at how different all, you know, some of the different breeds you had was. Because one of the larger birds you had, you said, was used in the war a lot. The, that particular breed was it's a racing homer, and that's the one they call the uh, messenger pigeon. Uh, they've been used in wars for hundreds of thousands of years. Well, so give give an example of how you know they would utilize those birds in war. Because I mean, back then we didn't have you know mm-hmm. phones or I mean ways to. They had the wire, you know. Oh, lot. They yeah. had the wire, and the wire would run out, right? So they could only go so far. Uh, in each uh, company or platoon, they would have certain guys even in airplanes, that they carried them in case they went Really? Down. Yeah. They would have little capsules on their legs and they'd open them up and they'd put a message in there and then turn it loose and it would fly back to base. And then they'd get it out and see what's going on. So all the birds, when men would go out, they would be trained that their home it's was at, at base. At base, yeah. Wow. So, yeah. I, and I never realized that, air, that airplane pilots would carry them in yeah. case they went down. That's mm-hmm. amazing. Another interesting thing, uh, too, um, the bir- these birds have way better eyesight than we do. And uh, a lot of times when planes would go down, the guys would be out in the water, they'd have those orange uh, lifesavers on. Uh, these birds see orange, red, better than any other colors. And they can see way, way farther than we can. So they would take these birds, they'd put them in an airplane, and those birds were trained if they seen orange or the color of the life preserver they would peck and then so the pilot would drop altitude so they could see wow and then get the guys so the other pigeons help them save a lot of guys out in the ocean that's amazing yeah they'd also use them um, for parts in factories sometimes the uh, parts would just have little problems that you couldn't see with the naked eye but the pigeons could see it so as the conveyor belt would go down if they seen a problem with the part they would peck so they'd pull it off the assembly line Really? Yeah, they're amazing. That is amazing. Mm -hmm. Well, and, you know, when I first, it's funny, because the way we met is my brother and I just came out to your all's place on Christmas to help set up a drum set. And, man, I appreciate that. I I looked at all that information, and uh, I said, there's no way. I said, man, I wish we knew somebody that knew how to put drums together. We've dealt with those crazy things for years and years and years. Gina goes, I know the guys. (laughs) And, yeah, and that was really nice of you to go out of your way, you and your brother, to come over and do that for well, us. Well, see, see what happened. This is what happened was you you created an IOU, and I'm just here redeeming it. Well, I'm 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 here to pay you back, buddy. So, you're working on a book right now. Uh, yes, I, I am. Uh, my brother over the years had always said, "Man, you know so much about pigeons. You should write a book." And I go, "Yeah, yeah." Well, a friend of mine called me one day, and I hadn't seen him in years. Name of Jamie Vandera. 
pretty famous guy for breaking glass. He has his own publishing company and stuff. And we start we started catching up. You know, how you been? What you been doing? He was filling me in on everything. It was real exciting. His life's really exciting. And uh, he said, hey, by the way, <coughs> if you're interested in putting a book together, uh, since you're a martial artist, you know, you might want to do one on martial arts, and I'll, I'll help you with it. I said, well, I'll think about it. And I did, and I just, I don't know. You know, I just didn't really have the confidence to sit down and do it. And then finally I decided, well, I think I will, you know. So I ran into Jamie at a, a funeral. One of our relatives had died. And, and I said, Jamie, I was thinking about what you said, and uh, I think I might might try the book. Or you still interested in that? Oh, yeah, yeah, brother, I'll help you out, you know. And then as we got to talking, uh, I was filling him in on meeting uh, Ben Novak, who works for uh, Revive and Restore, which is a branch off of uh, the Long Now Foundation. They're all bringing back extinct animals. And I was telling him this one particular guy was bringing back the extinct passion pigeon, and I connected with him, and uh, I'm going to help him do this. And uh, he said, oh, that's the book right there. He said, since you're already into pigeons, why don't we do a, a book to get you established uh, on your roller pigeons, and then we'll go into the uh, comeback, the big comeback of the passenger pigeon. So, okay, and so we started on it, and it'll be three years in uh, this coming October. I've been working on this thing, and uh, it's, it's, almost, it's almost come together. We're just about ready to put it out. Well, and it, you know, just from talking to you, I, I always think it's interesting because unless you're involved in something, you don't realize how deep, like, the well can go. Um, I, I think about friends that, whether they're passionate about woodworking, whether they're passionate about auto mechanics, I mean, all kinds of things. And when you're not involved in it, you don't realize like you how think, it, What could you write about a pigeon? Exactly. It's got, it's got 10,000 feathers. Yeah, right, right. You know. But sitting down with you, I mean, us just walking around your house, mm -hmm. talking about the pigeons, and going out and seeing them, I mean, it was like nonstop, like... We were standing out there, and you said, so what are the questions you got? And I'm like, my mind's blown right now. I don't know what else to ask you right now. You know, I always enjoy the tours. People come, want to see the birds. I always enjoy showing them around and answering the questions, and it's just a pure pleasure. And it always reminds me of when I was a kid, and the old guys would get me out and tell me whatever I wanted to know. But pigeons is a real passion. And since there were so many other pigeon guys, and then there's this ego thing, uh, that really kind of pushed me forward on the competition. So it, when you start competing, it's a whole different thing than being a pigeon keeper. And it does get pretty specific, pretty detailed uh, in order to compete. Well, so how do you, how do you train a bird <coughs> to go out and, I mean, it's one thing for them to leave and then come back. It's mm -hmm. another for them to go out and do you know, aerodynamic moves yeah. and then come back. Mm-hmm. Well, the aerodynamic moves is a genetic thing, about like a, a rabbit dog. Really? Yeah, you know how a rabbit dog's got this intrinsic trait to chase a rabbit? You know, you can't help it. Yeah, that. yeah. Same thing with these pigeons, they can't help it. Or a fainting goat, you familiar with fainting goats? No. Yeah. Oh, the fainting goats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you make yeah. a little clap and they flop over. It's the same kind of deal with these. Uh, it's kind of brought on by a, um, ex an excited contentment kind of thing. But the, the thing is, the duration of the roll. That's the hard part, keeping them from hitting the ground. And then also, if you're competing and they're too deep, say past three seconds on the performance, it takes too long for them to get back to the, the main flock and you lose points. So it's a real tricky deal. You want them deep enough to score well, but not too, de too deep to take away from yourself by them trying to regain altitude. Well, so then how do, you, how do you get them to fine tune that already intrinsic part of their nature that they're going to do this how do you get it to where it's more specific to where you ended up becoming a champion at it well that, that's a good question i don't, that, I don't that's want to a steal good the question. sauce that's, i don't want to steal the that's sauce a good question. Now. well that's why I, the book's coming out i'm, trying, <laughs> I'm break, breaking it all down and here here's how so it goes. that's that's a main point of the book then is yeah talking about how you've developed the training your pigeons exactly um I always compare it to like a basketball team or something. You know, it's a combination of, of uh, good food, uh, proper exercise, 
you can overexercise them, you can underexercise them, you can overfeed them, underfeed them. So it's a combination of feeding and exercise pretty much will get you where you want to be. Wow, mm -hmm. that's amazing. The, so it's you're really just letting them do what they're they're made what, to do. Exactly, and even even on rabbit dogs, for instance, you'll have good ones and bad ones. Same thing with these pigeons; you'll have good ones and bad ones, and you got to know the bad ones when you see them. And of course, you want to keep the good ones. It's all about the stalk loft. The better birds you can get into the breeding loft, the better off you'll be. It's all about percentages after that. You know, this pair throw seven good ones out of ten, to whereas this pair throw two, I probably should try another pair, mm. you know, that kind of thing. So, but to get the most work out of them, uh, what you want uh, in a competition, it's a combination of uh, the feeding and the exercise, you know. Well, and what's funny is you set out to write a completely different book. Initially. What, initially. Yeah. I was going to do a martial arts book. Yeah. Well, so that's a whole nother, whole that, nother world. That's a whole nother world. So talk yeah. to me then. Martial arts. So as far as what martial arts, I guess the first place to start is, oh, I think we said, what, you're a seventh degree yeah. black belt in what discipline? Uh, my rank comes from uh, a guy that used to be the head coach of the United States karate team. It's called uh, Koshi Tamasei Khan, American Karate Do Union. And uh, that was my last instructor. I've had several. He trained the first world champion we've ever had in amateur karate, a guy named Toki Hill out of Chillicothe. Wow. Uh, I'd been independent for a while. Uh, I started in Texas. I was 19 and moved to Texas. Uh, right before that, my cousin Rodney, uh, again, uh, went over to visit him. We were real tight, only three months difference in our ages. We ran around together all the time, all the time mostly uh, pigeons, sometimes station girls. And, uh, he, <laughs> and a few street fights. I mean, we always had each other's back. We were tight. And uh, I went over to his house one day to see him, and he was in the front room. He had all the furniture pushed back and everything. I said, Rodney, what are you doing? He said, oh, man, check this out, John. I'm glad you're here. I need a partner. <laughs> There's this guy on TV. It's like PBS or something. And he was doing martial arts techniques, showing how to do karate. And uh, he'd come on once a week or so. So me and Rodney got into that, and we would move all the furniture, and we would do that. We'd spar in his front room, and I remember hurting my foot, kicked him right in the knee when he was going to kick himself, and it was bent, and I had to use crutches for a while. But anyway, we was about uh, 15 then, and then by the time I was 19 and I moved to uh, Texas, I almost got into a class here, and uh, that then I ended up moving, so I found me a place out there called White Settlement Recreation Center. And it was a brand new place, something like the YMCA. And they had a little list of things. You can learn to play ping pong or be basketball or belly dancing. And then there's <laughs> the karate. And so I thought, oh, man, karate. Yeah, I want in that. So I signed up for it. And then after I signed up for it, I thought, oh, man, I was a nervous wreck. These guys, you know, you know, the fear of the unknown. You know, I'll probably get beat up. And, and it worked out really good. The first class, there was me. And about 20 little kids about this big. And I thought, I'm in there. I'm okay. I'll be all right. <laughs> you're, the, you're the one yeah. regular size guy. The rest is a bunch yeah, of kids. Yeah, a bunch of little kids. And, uh, and though that was a, a good thing, though, because being a teacher myself, you, kids can only handle like so much. And he needed a, a, another person, I guess, that can intellectually connect with him. And uh, I got a lot of attention out of this guy. Through time, though, some of his old uh, students from where he had taught before ca came in, and I got to work with them some. And uh, eventually, he talked me into going to my first tournament in uh, Kilgore, Texas, uh, at Kilgore College. It was uh, 17 in my division. I took third that day. So then I was hooked. And uh, then When you say tournament, you mean sparring. Uh, well, you go compete in uh, forms, which is kata and, and weapons, and then uh, what sparring, I guess you would call it. And then you get so many points depending on who hits who the most. Right, right. And, uh, yeah, I took third at that, and uh, then I was hooked. So eventually I came back to Portsmouth, and uh, I was a green belt then, and I uh, met a guy named uh, uh, Master Sprague, and I wanted in his class really, really bad. And in the meantime, I didn't know about Master Sprague, and my brother was a professional boxer, so I'd go over to the gym and hang out over there and uh, studied boxing for about six months. Thought I wanted to be a boxer. That stuff hurts. And, uh, 
we had a guy ranked eight, eighth in the world one time, and uh, Bobby uh, Bobby Sparks he fought Boom Boom Mancini once. And uh, anyway, there wasn't hardly nobody in there that particular day, but me and Bobby and the coach says, "Bender, I think you're ready." You know, for what? He said, "Well, get in there and spar." I had to spar this guy, and I was way bigger. He but he about beat me to death. Wow. And man, he was tough. He was tough. But uh, so then I got to watching how they was matching up. Some of these boxers might have 30 fights and fight a guy with two fights. And it's that it, I've seen a lot of that happen. And I thought, I don't want to be the guy that's the first fight fighting a guy with 20 fights right. because experience makes a difference. So <clears throat> I heard about Master Sprague and I hunted him down. They said, oh yeah, Master Sprague, he's the guy. And uh, he's having a demonstration out in the West Side somewhere. And I, I tracked it down. And I went out there and this guy was so cool. He walked on glass. He tore license tags and phone books into. He caught arrows that you shoot at him. And uh, he would break stacks of bricks this big, you know. And I thought, ugh. Oh. This is the guy. He ain't nothing like my other instructor, which was good. He would been a competition fighter for 15 years. You know, he studied under a guy that was friends with Chuck Nor Norris, named Pat Burleson. He had a lot going on. But this guy was amazing. It's like something you'd watch on TV, you know, and I thought... Buddy, you catch me to sign arrows, I'm signing up yeah, now. Yeah, I got to get in there. Well, in the meantime, when I was tracking this guy down, um, me and some of my friends was uh, practicing karate. We'd have our own little mats and stuff. And uh, we'd studied over, uh, over top of the old Peter Rose guy that owned that name, Les... Uh, can't think of Les's last name. He said, yeah, you guys can practice up there. So we started practicing up there, and it was real dirty. And... Uh, it's hard to stay clean. And one of the guys I was practicing with says, hey, man, there's a, uh, a church we can practice in. I said, my girlfriend's father is the preacher. And he said, we could go out there. So in the meantime, I was doing that. Well, Master Sprague had a student named Daryl Logan. Mm -hmm. Daryl Logan had uh, some friends uh, that heard about me, and they would come out and they'd work with me. Well, my style was a Korean style, and theirs was a Japanese style. So we would share. We would uh, switch. I would show them this. They would show me that. A couple of the guys were in the nunchucks, and I, I really liked those. So we would trade back and forth. And when they'd go back to class, I don't know if you know it a lot, but a lot of times uh, styles in martial arts is like uh, religious books. If it is isn't in my book, it don't count. Right. So right. When they would go back to class. They would be doing some of the stuff that I'd showed him, and that kind of aggravated him. He didn't like that, and I had the same problem with uh, uh, Shawnee State University. It's a guy named Tim Ostrom taught over there. Some of his people was coming out in Rosemount to the church out there and studying with me, and we were just sharing, having a good time. There's no money involved, but when they go back to their individual dojos, it caused a problem. They would uh, get chewed out for it, and they were forbid to come work with me so long story short I had to cover that to get back to Master Sprague so I'd watch him do this big fabulous uh, uh, demonstration and I thought man I got to get in his class so I go up to his class and I watch him and it's packed there's people everywhere and I'm wanting to talk to him you can't walk out on the floor and I kept thinking man I wish he would walk by you know like see the guy like talk to him and eventually he did and I waited forever finally he come by and of course you bow and uh, he bowed back. He said, what can I do for you? I said, well, sir, my name is, I know your name, real short with me. And I said, okay, uh, I'd really like to get in your class. I, I would really like to study here. And he goes, nope, your glass is too full. And walked off. Whoa. Yeah, messed me up. I was crushed. I, I, I really, I couldn't understand it. I just, I, I just couldn't understand what he meant. And after a few days of thinking, I went back and I said, uh, stood that same place, took forever again. He knew I was there. He just took his good old time. Finally, he came over and I bowed again and he bowed and he said, what can I do for you today, Bender? And I said, well, I really thought a lot about what you said and I don't have a clue what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Could you break it down for me? I said, because I really, really want to get in your class. He said, well, Bender, I think you're arrogant and cocky and you think you know everything. He said, do you, you know, your glass is too full. 
He says, uh, when your glass is too full, you can't put anything else in it. He said, the only way to put anything in it would be to empty some out. He said, do you think you could do that? That made sense to me. Yes. Yeah, I, I can do that. And he goes, well, maybe we can do something then. And I got in there, and I thought he would be really hard on me, but he was really good to me. He was patient. He took his time, and he showed me how to break bricks and run a class and how to stand and watch the door when you're teaching class. You can see who comes in and out, and that's where I got my black belt. Then later, I opened up a karate school and uh, ran independent for years. We did parades, and we did uh, demos for... Um, uh, new businesses, you know, we get out front and break bricks and do nunchucks and spar and do different things to get people to come over to check out the new store. And uh, we were in three parades a year. I had my own commercials and uh, radio and TV, and uh, everything was really going good. And then one of my students come in one day and she says, I was talking to this one martial arts guy, and he said, yeah, Bender's good over there, but uh, they're not certified. Certified, certified, run around. What do you got to be to be certified? Well, you got to be in with some big, large organization. I thought, hmm. I didn't like my student getting a feeling hurt. I thought, well, I'll get in with a big organization. Well, I got to checking around, and uh, Don Madden, head coach of the United States karate team, had a real good system going up in Chillicothe. So I was kicking that. At the same time, a friend of mine named Danny Lane up in uh, Huntington, West Virginia, had two or three schools. And word was Chuck Norris was going to come over because they were Norris system schools. Whoa. Yeah. And, man, he was like all that to me. I thought, man, I got to meet Walker, Texas Rangers yeah. show up. Yeah. You need to get out there. Yeah. And I did. And I went up there, and uh, he landed in a helicopter, and he came in and everybody. Wait, what? Oh, yeah. He landed in a helicopter? Yeah. Like yeah. out by yeah, the Yeah, outside, dojo? yeah, and comes in. Yeah, it was a brand new school. What that, year was this? Yeah. It was in the late seventies, early eighties. Holy like cow! So it's like yeah, many, him at the height of his powers. Oh yeah, yeah, he was all that at the yeah. Here it comes, you know. So is he tall? No, I I, you know it made me feel kind of good. I mean, you know, <laughs> I thought when I met him, I thought, man, I'm way bigger than Chuck. Of course, that would don't mean nothing, but <laughs> right, yeah, if he still kick your face. Yeah, off. I'm six three. I thought, well, he'd be my height, but he's probably five seven, five eight. I mean, he's not really a big guy. He's yeah, like, yeah. You know, so eventually he came in and my friend Danny, who was uh, the chief of the board of directors, uh, I used to go up and study with Danny and uh, he, inter he introduced us together. And uh, I did, oh, basically I just wanted to shake his hand, get a picture, and I did. Uh, while he was there, he sat down and he had uh, questions and answers and people was asking questions. One little guy says, can you beat up Chuck Nor or uh, Bruce Lee? And so he got into all that, you know. And I thought, man, you shouldn't have asked that. But uh, him and Bruce actually were good friends. He went on to explain, and uh, Chuck's first movie was one of Bruce Lee's movies. Uh, Bruce invited him to come over, and would you be interested in being one of my the, my movie? And Chuck says, yeah, and I think Chuck had one line in that. And uh, they, it's the big fight scene in the yeah, Coliseum. Where they're, yeah, yeah. they're in that like, big open hallway. Yeah. Oh, yeah. At the time, that was supposed to be the best choreographed fight scene to the Today, well, and that, probably that, back then they wanted to really paint it like there it was kind of real, you know. Mm -hmm. Like maybe they really didn't like each other, so maybe the punches were and kicks were a little more serious. Yeah. Well, you know that there. I think that particular film they was having problems with Bruce Lee, and they uh, brought in this big fighter from America to come take care of him. Right. Well, it didn't work, you know, Bruce got him, but man, it was a great fight scene. But anyway, he talked about his movies, he talked about him and his, uh, uh, his son, I can't remember his son's name right now, but his son and Bruce Lee's son, Brandon, were good buddies, and he told a little story about how they would uh, go down to the docks there in L.A., hanging out, you know, being buddies, and uh, strike up a conversation. People would be talking to him and say, oh, yeah, what's your name? And they'd say, well, my something Norris. And the other one would go, yeah, my name's Brandon Lee. He said, he's Chuck Norris's kid, and I'm Bruce Lee's kid. And they go, yeah, right. No one ever believed him. And Chuck just laughed. He thought that was so funny. But he sat there, and he told a lot of good stories. And I thought, well, I got my picture, uh, you know, and uh, got to talk to him a second. And so I started to head out. And I made it clear over to the door, and uh, Norris stood up, and he says, uh, Excuse me, excuse me. He said, are you leaving? I said, yeah, I was getting ready to go. 
He goes, could you hang on a second? I'd like to talk to you. And I said, yeah. Chuck Norris wants to talk to me. Yeah. Run. Yeah, right. All my plans I'll just be, got canceled. Yeah, yeah, I'll be right here. So uh, he finished what he was doing, and he finally came over. And he says, Danny tells me that you've got a karate school. And I said, yeah. And he said, uh, black belt? And I said, yeah, yeah. He said, where'd you get your rank from? And I said, well, I got my rank from a guy named Pete Ludwig, who was a student under uh, the guy's name I mentioned earlier, Pat Burleson. And he goes, oh, yeah, Pat, Pat, we're good friends. And I thought, oh, cool. I, yeah, I didn't know that. And uh, we talked about a few other things. It's been so many years. I can't remember. But I remember during that conversation, I had uh, one of my cards, Bender Karate Academy. And I said, hey, man, take this. I said, if you ever need a bad guy, I'm your guy. I'd be glad to be a bad guy in any of your movies. And he looked at it, and he smiled, and he says, well, you never know. You know, and he put it in his pocket. Well, a few days later, <clears throat> now, backing up just a little bit, I had to get that in there. I went up to uh, Don Madden's, and uh, pretty cocky. I was kind of cocky back then. And I went in with some of my entourage, and we were pretty cool. We had our black and gold jackets and our black and gold scarves and our cool hats, and we were all that, we thought. And uh, he was teaching class, and he seen us come in, and he seen he knew who I was because of the tournaments. We were the bad guys, I guess you would call us, uh, for lack of a better term. Uh, his people would practice on us because they were USA team members. So they would throw these tournaments and the outsiders would come in and I was an outsider and they would compete with us and that helped keep them in shape for international competition. So I really wasn't one of them. My style, my kicks were different, everything was different. So, but I wanted in, this certification thing just kept sticking in my mind from yeah. the girl earlier. And uh, so he turned his class over to one of his instructors and he said, I'll be right back. See, you guys come, you want to talk to me? I said, yeah. So we go to this back room and I go in real cocky and he says, what can I do for you? And I lean back and I said, well, I want in. <laughs> he said, excuse me. I said, I want in your organization. He goes, now, uh, Bender, it ain't that easy. He said, uh, you can't just walk in and say you want in. I said, well, I'm telling you right now, I want in. I'm going to do whatever it takes to get in. I said, what do I need to do? He said, well, for one, he said, there's a guy down in your area named Daryl Logan that has a, um, can't think of the term, but it's on paper. Nobody else can. Uh, in, like a no compete clause or something yeah, like that. Yeah, it's anybody in that same organization can't be within so many miles of you because right, it would right. hurt your business, right? So I couldn't be in there because Darren already had the slot, or Daryl. And uh, so I said, well, okay. Well, as time went on, him and Daryl had a fallen out. The door was open. So I went right back. He let me in. I stayed with him about three years. My goal at the time was to be a world champion. I mean, that was the big, big goal. And uh, I finally made the uh, uh, United States Karate Federation was the governing body of karate at the time. And uh, they actually let me run a school for them. Wow. Yeah. And I also had, there's different color patches. You get a particular patch when you're a team member. So I got a USA team member patch. And that qualified me for international travel to compete with them and uh, after a while it got to the point where they said okay we're going to uh, I can't remember if it's New York or Chicago I'm thinking Chicago you beat this guy and you can go to the world championships in uh, Cairo Egypt and I said whoa I believe it was Cairo well and I just want to I just want to interject one yeah. thing so People know when you go to a karate tournament, when you're black belt, it's full contact, isn't it? Uh, the black belts do tend to hit a little hard. Yeah, yeah, they do. They do. Yeah, but it's called semi semi contact. You're really not supposed to like break noses and right, right stuff like but that. Like I mean, in the MMA, now MMA, it's about as hard as it gets. Right, but you're. You know? I mean, you're having. A oh, it hurts. Exchange. It hurts. I've had cracked ribs, broken bones, stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. 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 So anyhow, so you've got to compete against this one guy, and if so, you could qualify to go to Egypt. Yeah, and I thought, man, I, I got it. I got this. But actually, I didn't. He got me by one point, so I didn't get to One that. point? Yeah. But looking back, 
And then at, at that time, I was about 35. And they say as a fighter at 35, you start going downhill as a fighter. And I really competed a lot up till then. And they opened every door they could possibly open for me. And so I have no regrets. But there's some really good fighters out there, man. They, this guy got me. So after that, I started reflecting more back on uh, teaching and things like that. So, yeah. But I've produced a lot of good students over the years. Uh, I've had international gold medalists. I've had tough man uh, champions here locally. Um, I've, I've had a lot of success. One of my all-time best was a guy named Cody Groves. He's had uh, like 300 trophies and awards. Wow. Yeah. And uh, walk into a tournament like it's had 14. Uh, um, I can't remember the term. Yeah, there's a term for it. You just go in, you win everything, you, you go home. He's done that 14 times. He's got uh, all kind of state championships. He's done really, really well. And he teaches locally now. Uh, well, and how's that feel? Because originally, you know, you're, you said your goal was to be a national champion. And you made it to, you know, what you felt like the height that you could make yourself. But yeah. then to have a student go and be successful. Oh, yeah. Cody done everything I wanted to do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Except, you know, uh, he didn't win the world championship. But he did play six in the world championships down in Florida. Wow. Yeah. So I, I, got, I got it all back. You know, I did the best I could. But I realized that when I trained people, they were better than I was. I, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I had a lot of them. So uh, it, it was a good uh, – a good life for 37 years I did that and I got up to seventh degree and it's getting harder to stretch uh, harder to heal I still like to spar uh, spar all the time but I'm bruising easier now I'm 62 and then I also thought if I'd take more time out from the martial arts I'd have more time to help this guy bring back the extinct passenger pigeon right right it's like there's karate I've done that now I'd kind of like to do this with the Jurassic Park kind of thing. Right, I think that's right. pretty cool. So that's where I, my head's at right now. But over the years, I've trained dogs. I was an orkin man. I've done a little bit of everything. I've worked on the river. No, yeah. That's what I told. Uh, that's what I told you after finding out just a little bit about you. You're like Southern Ohio's most interesting man in the world. You're like the <laughs> Dos Equis guy of Southern Ohio. I appreciate that, but you know. Um, it's just been, uh, I've just been driven to chase my dreams. Um, I had a friend of mine named jo Josiah Whitley. He, uh, oh, worked. yeah. Yeah, I, you know Josiah. I know Josiah. Yeah, I used to work with him, and uh, he's doing real good now. He would come over uh, at work. Uh, I mean, I've been a custodian for like 25 years for Willersburg Schools, and uh, they got a real good uh, system over there. And uh, Josiah worked with us. He, he went to school over there, and he started uh, working with us in the summer. And uh, so I had a lot of time to sit and talk to Josiah on breaks and things. And he's really into the music. Oh, he's phenomenal. Loves musician. to write his own stuff and all that. But he was always getting slammed, even by certain relatives, which I won't name, that, oh, you, you know, why go and uh, get this degree in accounting and then run off and try to be a singer? You're not, you know, it's not going to happen. And I would always sit and say, man, I'm, I'm going to tell you something. Every time somebody told me I couldn't, you know, Bender's got good pigeons, but he's, they're not all that good. Well, I proved a point. I became a world champion with them. Uh, Bender, uh, his karate school, blah, blah, blah. All right, well, I got in, I got certified, I made USA team, uh, did all these things, had a wonderful career. I, I trained all kinds of champions. It's just, that was a dream of mine. I wanted to pursue that. And there's always people trying to knock you down. I told you, I said, don't let people knock you down. Pursue your dreams, go as far as you can, and you know. But I said, you're young, you got all kind of time ahead of you. You're driven. You got this inspiration to do these things. You got all this knowledge. You're a smart guy. Just, just go, go chase it. Because here's what'll happen if you don't. Someday you'll be old, and you'll sit there, and you'll say, I wonder what would have happened if I would have done this or that. Now, saying that, Chuck Norris wanted me to run a school for him. I found out later. I had really? a, yeah, I had an opportunity to, Chuck was impressed by me, and, and Danny calls me up and he says, um, John, I'll talk to you a second. I said, yeah, Danny, what's on your mind? He said, well, we was on the helicopter and Chuck Norris reached in, <laughs> Chuck Norris reached in his pocket and he pulls out this card and he says, hmm, he said, Danny, he said, you know, I like this guy. 
He goes, is that right? He goes, yeah. He said, you know, usually when I'm having these talks and being around people, he said, there's always, they're always coming up and saying, I'm a black belt. I got a karate school. And they're he said, he never, ever even mentioned it. He said, I wouldn't have known if you didn't tell me. He said, see what you can do for him. And I said, what does that mean? He goes, oh, John, that means you're in there, man. I'll tell you what we can do. We can rebuild your karate school. We'll put Nora systems on it. The only thing you need to do is change your uniforms from black to white. You have to rearrange your forms a little bit. But he said, you're in there. I thought, oh, man, that's fantastic. Chuck likes me, right? Right. He was my hero anyway. I watched everything he's ever done. <coughs> he's a Korean stylist, uh, Tang Soo Do, I believe is what his style is. But anyhow, uh, at the same time, I'd already went up there and, uh, and told Don Madden I want in, and the, now the doors are open. So now everything is open for me. Which way do I want to go? So I ended up, I thought, well, I want to be a world champion, so I, I think I'll go with... Uh, Don Madden, because the United States Credit Federation is the governing body for international travel. So I thought I made the right decision, and I still don't regret it. But I still do wonder what would have happened if I would went with Chuck. At the time, I kind of waited out. I thought, well, maybe I'll get in a movie or something, you know. Uh, I didn't really know what doors he could open for sure and this and that. And I really liked the guy, but I, I went the other way. But as time passed, I actually got to get in a movie. And that, that was pretty cool. It was a martial, really? Yeah, a martial arts movie called Best of the Best Three. And it, it was a lot of fun. I was an extra there for about uh, two weeks. Mm. And eventually, you had this big group of guys, and we were it's a skinhead movie, and they would go grab these di different extras and say, we want you to do this, we want you to do that, okay? And uh, we sat around most of the time. But uh, one day they come up and they wanted me to do uh, an action scene with the star. All the other guys said, oh, I can't believe that you got that. Really? Yeah, oh, it's great. Yeah, yeah. But it was real quick. I was supposed to interfere. We had a bad guy and the, the star, uh, Philip Ree, he was the good guy. And I interfered with the fight. And it was kind of a way for the movie for the good guy to get a knife because the bad guy had a knife and he didn't have a knife so I had a knife on me so when I interfered he breaks my arm he takes the knife he finishes the fight you know and it was really fun I had one other scene where I got to uh, be a guard they said you know the guy's coming and everything you know and uh, they panned down from the speaker down to me and uh, it was really great it was really great so I finally did get to get in a movie but I would love to have been in a movie with Chuck Norris. That would have just been wonderful. So that's kind of my martial arts career no, that's, in, in a nutshell. That's amazing. You know, it's interesting to me because with your story, your thing really was you found out the things that you liked and you just went for it, man. Yeah, I just went for it. Didn't know what I was doing. Yeah, and I want to point that out. Much of the time, I didn't have a clue. <laughs> but if you go and you get your feet wet, you can learn as you go, and you can still exceed past everybody else that might already have a little bit of an edge on you if you're driven. Well, and like you, you talked about how you, when you were younger, you were cocky and things like that. But at the same time, like I think about that conversation you had with Chuck, yeah, and how it stuck out to him because you weren't talking about all the things that you had done. You just had a conversation with him like a normal person. Yeah, I, I just wanted to meet the guy. I mean, he was my hero. I didn't tell him that, but yeah, right, he, right. he was my hero. I think uh, the picture I had, I wrote a whole bunch of stuff on the back of it. This was my greatest day in my life. Right, you know? right. Yeah, it was cool. But uh, yeah, uh, sometimes ego and confidence and cockiness kind of all gets merged into one. And some people will read it wrong. But I had to have some self-confidence, so I carried myself a little different than most people because I was um, very confident. Uh, at the same time, you don't want to show other people your weaknesses. Are you, are you with me? Like oh, the, yeah. If you're going to have yeah. a fight and you're afraid of this guy, you don't show it. You do not show it. The last thing you want to do is, is show fear. So a lot of people probably, maybe some didn't like me because they thought I was too cocky and brash or whatever, but you, you gotta have some of that with you to get through it. And if you don't, I would suggest you act like you do because yeah. it does open doors, it does. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. Listen, I really appreciate us getting to sit down and talk to him. I mean, I, like, I'm just stoked that you're writing a book. Now, do you guys have an idea about when you're gonna be done? I know with books, sometimes it's hard talent. We're looking at a couple months to be totally finished. And uh, 
It shouldn't be too much longer after that, right? I'm looking over at my publisher here. Yeah, there you go. So maybe like late, looking at maybe late 2019. Um, yeah, best we can figure about. No, right that's now. awesome. Well, yeah. thanks so much again, John. Hey, I, super I appreciate it. I was a little nervous, but you made me feel real comfortable. Yeah, you beat right. the tar out of my microphone. I know. It's like that's the like, fourth or fifth time. You just couldn't help yourself. You got the martial <laughs> arts mode, man. I'm just glad it's not real expensive. But plus, I don't think I heard it too much. No, you do.